Welcome to our Oxford Impact webinar. This is Gail Peterson. I'm the Program Director for Oxford Social Finance and Impact Investing Programs. I want to thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world, it's, uh, whether Oxford, Asia, or California. Um, so let's get started. Um, it's an exciting opportunity to talk with, uh, with colleagues about the, the need for moving a bank to yes and examining how leaderships, prototypes, and partnerships have led UBS to support the SDGs. Um, we want to give you some, uh, some photos, our favorite photos of Oxford, the spires of Oxford. It's one of the most beautiful places that uh, we think in the world. And um, to get you imagining what it's like to be a student at Oxford, if, and uh, many of our colleagues who've Many of our colleagues who have joined the webinar as participants are alums, are new students who are enrolled in our social finance course, and are um, our colleagues who are now part of our Oxford community. The Impact Series is really designed to show how capital, and when we think about capital, not just financial capital, but social capital, environmental capital, human capital, can tackle the world's most complex issues. Um, our goal is to share groundbreaking ideas and to have a conversation with our community. And that's what we're going to do today, to build and strengthen a global network. And, and because we're dealing with the world's most complex issues, it requires all of us to be involved in the conversations from very, very different perspectives. Whether you're from government, whether you're from the private sector, whether you're from the C CSO community, philanthropy, it's pulling together our different perspectives to come up with new solutions. Next slide, please. Oxford Site Business School, again, is we, we consider ourselves a hub for just that, bringing together world-class community to pull together these new ideas and new innovations of ways of thinking about having a positive global impact. Next slide. And the impact portfolio offers um, so we started with impact investing. We're moving into our ninth year uh, in March. Social finance is three years old and impact measures is two. And it, and it was really designed to allow our students to, our executive students to understand how these pieces fit together. Impact investing is deal centric. Um, how do I create a fund? How do I do a project um, in, in conservation or in child protection? in a particular geographic location. Social finance is blended capital at scale. Now we use the word scale a lot. For us, it means citywide, countrywide, continent-wide, globally. So it's amassing money and ideas together to solve those big problems. Impact measures gets goes deep into what are the new innovations around measuring positive and negative impact of deal-centric or blended capital deals. And it's that those three together really give our students a thorough understanding of what it takes to walk in the world of social finance, social change, to have a positive impact. Next slide, please. When we think about the where the ecosystem, the financial ecosystem looks like, traditional philanthropy is included in our social finance program. Uh, where there is no return or a social return on investment. Impact investing focuses on potentially below market and market rate return. And then we look at traditional business and what traditional business can offer in terms of a financial return. So we work across that spectrum from catalytic philanthropic resources to traditional finance and how we begin to work together to find the resources necessary at scale to create the change that we want. Next slide, please. I use this as, go back to that, that nasty nest of, of that. It, when we think about unraveling the wicked, we call those complex issues wicked problems. And, and that we own the solutions, and that we, that again, there isn't a one way of looking at how to solve a wicked problem. And that's really what our social finance and our impact investing program look at. Next slide, please. Social finance in particular focuses on sustainable development goals and trying to fill the void that's needed of, 
uh, several trillions to actually begin to achieve the sustainable development goals. And so we, we look at all 17 of those goals and the relationship, that complexity of nests, um, poverty impacting hunger, impacts gender, impacts education. So we look at those as nexus issues, not solitary issues, but how they are part of a system. Next slide, please. This gives you a sense of our global network. Um, and uh, and a colleague said to me the other day, we've, we've got so many, we've, we've reached 500 students from 90 countries um, with investable assets in the trillions. And again, 75% of our students come from finance and many of them are moving into the space of social change, social finance for the very first time. And there are other colleagues that are coming from uh, CSO, philanthropy, uh, government, so we look at this as an opportunity, we call it lost in translation, to find new ways of communicating, to identify new solutions, and to bring our knowledge resources, uh, financial resources together to, to find problem solving. And our goal is to catalyze this global network and to work together through matchmaking programs and sharing of knowledge. Next slide. Today is an opportunity to, to, for you to get to know one of our, our guest faculty in our social finance program, um, Phyllis Kurlander Costanza. She's the CEO of UBS Optimus Foundation, great colleague, um, friend, and, and is an amazing teacher. And so she is going to be, a, again, sharing with her us her experiences as someone within a bank who's come from philanthropy and and the private sector, government, um, to, to really building um, partnerships within the bank and, and beyond the walls of the bank to actually look at problem solving in the area of social finance. And we have a, we've done a case study on the UBS social finance portfolio, and Phyllis is going to talk about that. But one of the things I think it's really important for all of our students to understand we not only share how to do the deals and put in partnerships and, and use to deploy capital, but one of the things and the biggest challenges that many of our students take when they go back, leave Oxford, go back to the institutions, is how do we get it to stick? How do we change the behavior and the culture within our own organizations to bring in new ideas? So we spend a lot of time in our class on that issue. We're gonna teach and train and coach and come up with new solutions, but how do we change behavior and, and get a culture within an organization for whom these concepts may be new to, to begin to adopt them? So uh, Phyllis is gonna join us. Not only will our new students at Social Finance get an opportunity to meet her, um, as will our other participants, and for our alums to um, reacquaint themselves with her. So I wanna, Again, presentation. Okay, so moving on, I think Gail was running into a little bit of um, signal problem where she's based today. Um, we'd like to hand over um, to Phyllis, who's going to be talking about um, her work um, at the UBS Optimus Foundation. Um, so oh, just gonna... Annabelle, it, my, oh, technology, okay, my technology is solved. So I want to okay. just go through uh, very briefly some key points in terms of why things are changing within the context of, of business moving into, whether it's the finance, whether it's a bank or any other kind of business or organization. Um, there are a number of things that are happening uh, that the CEOs of the world are recognizing, and there's a nice quote from Sergio Armati, who's the C CEO of UBS. Again, it's, it's clear that, that clients are demanding impact, positive impact, and that this is, is fueling the financial, financial sector in powerful ways. So not only are there client demands by women, millennials, and Generation Z, um, the UN uh, SDGs uh, are also calling for private sector funding. Um, the US-based Business Roundtable announced that 181 CEOs are calling for sustainability as 
as important, if not more important, as shareholder demands. So there are pressures um, uh, to do to think and act differently within the corporate sector. Next slide, please. Um, again, leadership is a driver, and I think this quote from um, Duncan Austin is really important. Um, a key success, possibly the key success of sustainable business is a new generation of business leaders and who are thinking very deeply about what it, what it takes to live on the earth, what it takes to, to really incur those costs, and how do we begin to think differently. Um, the markets are, are, are also making money. Markets around sustainability are making money. According to the Financial Times, European funds are, are top performers. And that, um, so there's real proof that in fact, doing the right thing can make money. Next slide, please. And I think that we're seeing it not just with UBS, Goldman Sachs has acquired Imprint Capital and, and, and in July announced the Sustainable Finance Group. Schroeder's the UK second listed asset manager, bought a, a major stake in Blue Orchard Finance. Um, and, I, and I think that the you know, chief executive, Peter Harrison's quote about the mood music is changing. Um, RBC's hired as you so founder and climate divest activist, um, Tom Van Dyke. Again, and UBS is focusing on, on sustainable development goals. So you're watching a sea change and a movement within the financial sector um, to be engaged in, in, in changing leadership, changing ideas, is and changing their portfolio and the use of their resources. Next slide, please. Um, we'll provide this information again. It, 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 it examines RBC's study, Morgan Stanley and Deloitte, saying that younger generations are really calling out for investment firms, um, the financial sector, to really be more involved in social change and that they believe that their investments can make a difference. Next slide, please. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Phyllis, and she can walk you through um, her experiences and, uh, and very concrete examples of development impact bonds and social success notes. Thanks, Phyllis. Great. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. Um, it is a really exciting time to be in finance right now. And uh, it wasn't that way eight years ago. I remember my first day at UBS, uh, I showed up and by the end of the day, I thought, oh, I've made a terrible mistake. It's going to be really hard to convince a bank that this is important. And this was just a very small piece of of what needed to be done overall. At the time, Optimus Foundation was a very small entity. We were raising about $10 million a year, uh, relative, you know, small, relatively speaking. And uh, we were operational in one location in Switzerland. And um, I asked the chair of the board what he wanted me to do. Um, do you want me to maintain the status quo? Do you want me to tweak the foundation around the edges or is this a total overhaul? Well, this was a Swiss bank, so total overhaul is generally not the option they would choose. And he said, you know, just a little tweaks around the edges. I want you to basically take it to the next level, um, which is what I've been trying to do with a great team um, over the past eight years. And what I thought I would do is start out by just giving you an overview of who is UBS, what do we do, what are the priorities, and then um, an overview of where we sit, the philanthropy team sits in this structure. And then I'll talk through development impact bonds, social success notes, and, um, and also a recent campaign that UBS has launched around the SDGs. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. So um, let's move to the first slide. What is UBS? Who is UBS? Uh, it is a large global firm with almost 67,000 employees. And um, we're a financial institution, but the largest part of the business is the wealth management business. We are the largest wealth management firm in the world. We actually bank half of the world's billionaires, which we also have an investment bank, of course, and we have personal and corporate banking, asset management, and this is all supported by a really robust corporate center, which is actually where we sit. 
we sit within a group called UBS in Society. And that is, um, it's, it's an overarching group that is really focused on making sustainable performance the standard across UBS. And we look at it in terms of our financing, how we work with communities philanthropically. So how do we work with our clients philanthropically? How do we form partnerships, collaborate? And also our policies and procedures. You know, what do we do as a business to promote sustainable performance? Next slide, please. And the philanthropy services team falls within UBS in society. And we're trying to operate in this unique space which is good for clients, good for society, and good for UBS and its employees. And what does that mean? And how do we achieve that? Well, on the client side, we know that more than 90% of our large clients are engaged in philanthropy, yet fewer than 20% of them are actually satisfied that they're making an impact. So we wanna try to drive them towards more impactful change. Then on the UBS employee side, UBS won't continue to support this unless it's good for business, unless employees are seeing a benefit from this. Um, and it is a really strong differentiator for the bank. I've had many clients come uh, tell us point blank that the reason that they came onto the UBS platform and the reason they're using UBS services is because of our robust philanthropy offering. And also it's good for employees. We, Whenever we post a job, we get tons of internal CVs for roles. Employees want to engage, they want to volunteer, and that makes them really proud to know that UBS is putting so much into this. And then of course, its impact on society. And directly through the foundation, we can track our impact, but also we take real positions on issues. So we're trying to move our clients away from things that um, not only may not be impactful, but may actually be harmful. And we will tell them, you know, don't focus on building an orphanage in a community. Instead, you should put your resources towards keeping families together and providing them with what they need in order to take care of the, their children on their own. Next slide, please. So what is it that we offer our clients with philanthropy services? We offer them really three, um, there's, there's three pieces of our, of our offering. One is advice, the next one's insights, and then we have an execution platform. And the advice is, is a pretty standard financial institution offering. I would say that probably every single financial uh, institution offers clients advice on philanthropy. That is, we help clients with, um, do they want to set up, if they're in the U.S., a 501c3 or in any other country, what's the best entity to structure to give away money? Um, what is, how do we help them think through their strategy or their vision? And, and that is um, that is standard. Uh, I would say we do it really well, though. <laughs> uh, and then we offer our clients insights. And here's where we start to differentiate ourselves. We actually take clients out to the field. So, for instance, we recently took a group of clients out to Liberia to see what it's like to um, to support good philanthropic efforts in some of the most challenging places. And we brought them there. We first had a meeting, and this was a small group, probably 10 clients. We met with um, former president Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She gave the clients a context about um, Liberia. What's What are the issues around education and healthcare? We then flew them out um, to the southern part of the country where uh, we went to visit an organization called Last Mile Health. We put them on the back of motorbikes, drove them out into the bush about 45 minutes, and they saw what it's like to deliver healthcare in some of the most challenging and complex situations. Uh, and we also do philanthropy uh, conferences. Uh, we have one coming up uh, soon in Detroit, as a matter of fact, in the U.S. Uh, and then finally, the execution platform, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And the execution platform is really where we're trying to drive our clients. And this is um, not only donor-advised funds, but 
uh, more specifically the UBS Optimist Foundation, which is actually helping our clients in making recommendations on programs that they can support in trying to encourage clients to do it together. And really on a high level, what we're trying to achieve here is we're trying to bring more money and better money to solve key social challenges. Next slide, please. How do we do this? There's, there's three principles that we adhere to uh, in our giving, and one is collective philanthropy. We're really trying to bring our clients together because no matter how wealthy they are, not one of them can solve any of these problems on their own. The other thing is around building equitable partnerships, working with the communities uh, in which we're engaging to make sure that we're listening to them. You know, they, there's that expression, the one with the pesos has the sesos. And, um, you know, that's certainly not uh, what we adhere to. And it's really important that we also convey that to um, our clients and to other partners we work with, that we shouldn't be coming in with a solution looking for the problem. And then finally, we're looking to maximize long-term impact. So we're really always looking at uh, what is the exit strategy here? How will this be sustained in the long term? And we do this with offices uh, around the globe now. We now, um, as when I started, we were in Switzerland. We now have offices for the foundation, in, not only in Switzerland, but in Germany, the UK, the US, Hong Kong, China, India, and soon to be in Singapore. Next slide, please. So how do we go about building these collective portfolios? We do it in two ways. One is through straightforward philanthropic programs. Right now we've got about 200 programs under management. We're trying to bring our clients into those programs. Um, and we also do it through social finance, which is what we'll focus on. And within both of those approaches, we're focused in four areas. One is healthcare, second is education, third area is child protection, and we're just adding the environment now. And again, within each of those areas, we further um, specify where we'll work because we need to really find um, focus areas if we wanna drive change. We're trying to move our clients into areas that that are not only needs in the communities in which we work, but also areas where we know from working with clients for almost 20 years on these issues, that these are issues that our clients care about. These are issues that they're willing to put money behind. Next slide, please. So how do we define social finance and what is it? Gail showed a, a slide also, which gave you a spectrum from philanthropy um, to finance. And the way we look at it is, if you look at philanthropy, you've got charitable giving, which is the basic, you know, spray and pray, hope it works. And then there's strategic philanthropy, which is more venture philanthropy um, that goes by many names, but it's more thoughtful on, um, this is where I think I can move the needle. Therefore, I will focus my energies in a specific area in order to have the greatest impact. And then there's social finance, which is uh, impact first finance, meaning, we are willing to take financial compromises. We, in fact, want financial returns to be directly linked to impact. And we keep that within philanthropy, which I think will explain how we were able to do this in a large financial institution. Because then below that, you see sustainable investing. And sustainable investing is really categorized into three broad buckets. You've got uh, exclusion, let's take out these, um, these things that actually harm the environment or the world. Um, integration, these are uh, risk-adjusted financial returns, like um, think about ESG, trying to finance only companies that have good environmental, social, and governance records and policies. And then you have impact investing, which is directly focused on delivering financial returns and social returns without any compromise on the financing. And that's UBS's position on impact investing. So within social finance, we're not saying that. We're saying, yeah, we do have to take a we do have to take a, a 
bit of a compromise on uh, the financial returns because we are focused on impact first. Uh, next slide, please. Within social finance, what is it that we're trying to do? It's really three things. One is we want to build the ecosystem around this, develop partnerships. So we're funding, in fact, um, Go Labs at Oxford University to help develop a website that um, working with others, including Brookings uh, and social finance, to keep an up-to-date website on where are the latest sibs and dibs and um, what, are the, what are the lessons learned from them so that it, it's a resource for everybody who wants to work in this space. Um, we're also looking at new models. You know, we're, we're here to experiment. We still believe that philanthropic capital is risky capital, that we should be testing new models because um, as I like to say all the time, the, you know, these are not the thing. Dibs are not the thing. Social success, no, this is not the end game, but it is the thing to the thing. It will get us to the next place. It will get us to that type of financing mechanism that will drive greater social change. And then we're looking to scale this. You know, if you look at the capital markets, there's about more than $290 trillion being traded in the capital markets, yet the money focused on SDGs is less than 1% of that. How can we capture some of that money from the capital markets in order to drive larger scale change? Next slide, please. So now I'll talk through a couple of examples. First is Educate Girls. And um, many of you on this call are probably aware this was the first development impact bond and um, we partnered alongside Educate Girls, who was the implementing partner, also Children's Investment Fund Foundation, who was the outcome come funder, and ID Insights was the evaluator for this, and Instiglio, and Instiglio um, was the performance manager. This is a perfect example of creating the, um, building the ecosystem. This was a relatively small development impact bond. We put a lot of resources in it. So if you looked at this and said, wow, that cost a lot and it was complicated to build, you're absolutely right. Um, the cost to build it was almost more, it was more than the grant itself, but we really wanted to test whether or not this could work. Um, and the outcomes were impressive. So how did it work? UBS Optimist Foundation gave a loan, let's say, I mean, really a development impact bond is, is nothing more than performance-based contracts. It is not a bond at all. Um, it is not a fixed income product. We gave let's say a loan basically to, um, or a grant to educate girls. Educate girls had very clear targets. Get a certain number of girls into school and improve learning outcomes by 75% better than a control group. Children's Investment Fund Foundation would pay only if educate girls achieved those goals. So what's in it for them? Why would they do this? Why would they pay a premium to us so that we could get a return to pay educate girls? Well, the reason they would do that is because it completely eliminates the risk for them. Uh, Children's Investment Fund Foundation performs a tremendous amount of due diligence. Sometimes it could take up to, to a year to perform due diligence on an organization they want to fund because they want to make sure that they're funding only the best organizations that have the potential to scale. So we said to them, basically, hey, you don't have to do that due, dil due diligence. You only pay if this works. And so, you know, you're willing to take on that additional premium for that risk. So we tested this for three years. ID Insights ran a randomized control trial. And at the end of this, if you go to the next slide, the results were really interesting. Um, I'll take you through year one results. If you look at this, um, at this graph, you see 48% um, was the target for 48% um, was the number of girls that we were trying to get enrolled into school. And it was 
below our goal, our annual goal, and um, the target for learning progress was also low in year one. And this is because um, Educate Girls still had to test the model that was most effective. And you know, many people would have canceled after year one and said, hey, you didn't achieve the goals, we're out of here. Um, but it was important to, to give them the opportunity to learn. And what was key to this is Educate Girls had a performance management system in place so they knew in real time whether or not they were performing or not. They knew, hey, this school over here had poor math test results uh, last week. Why was that? And they could see, oh, it's because the, the kids weren't taught decimals. They don't really understand decimal places. So they went back in and were able to teach the kids in a different way. And then when they tested them again, those math scores went way up. <clears throat> and then by year three, the results far exceeded the targets. They achieved 160% of the learning targets and 116% of the enrollment targets. So we were paid back by Children's Investment Fund uh, equivalent to a 15% internal rate of return. That money um, went in part 32% to educate girls as a bonus to them. And we're recycling that money to use it again. So now we look at this as a possible revenue stream. We keep the money within the philanthropic pool. So that's why we classify it still as philanthropy because we're not giving money back to clients so that they can buy a new car. We're keeping that money within the foundation so we can recycle it and use it again. And clients who invest in these will know, hey, you got 115% of your return back. Let's work together to figure out where we're gonna use it next. So that's one example of a social finance vehicle. Um, another one, if we go to the next slide, please, where, um, the financial returns are directly linked to the outcomes themselves is called a social success note. Um, here we work with Eunice Social, social Business and also with the Rockefeller Foundation and the implementing organization here is an organization called Impact Water Uganda. They are a social business providing low cost clean water systems to low cost private schools in Uganda. And as those of you on the phone know, um, water systems aren't straightforward. And the African continent is littered with water systems that don't work. So the incentivization was not just about getting the water system in the school. It's about making sure that kids are actually drinking that water and washing their hands with clean water and soap so to prevent illness. So we said to Impact Water, OK. Um, let's give you a, we'll give you a concessional rate to start. So the interest rate on the loan is 5%. However, as attendance rates in the school go up, your interest rate on the loan will come down. And the hypothesis being, of course, if children are, uh, and teachers are taught about uh, the use of clean water, which leads to behavior change, then children will be healthier and they won't miss school as much. So as that attendance rates go up, goes up, the interest on the loan goes down, and Rockefeller Foundation in this case is the outcome funder. They, if, if the outcomes are achieved, they pay a bonus to Optimus, so our rate of return can go as high as 9%, and the interest rate on the loan for Impact Water could go down as low as 1.9%. So that is the the another example of how we're using social finance and impact to drive financial returns. So what does this mean? Let's go to the next slide for the bank at large. We're focused at the Optimus Foundation on some very specific SDGs around children's issue. They touch on quite a lot of them though, but UBS as a bank has also through the introduction of UBS in society, is very committed to addressing the SDGs. And it doesn't mean that we're gonna address every single one, but one way that um, UBS is committed to doing this is by raising awareness and driving more revenue towards these programs. 
So it launched a program um, called Together Band on the next slide. And this is an effort working with others to raise awareness about the SDGs. To, to raise awareness amongst regular people. You know, all of us on the phone here have all heard of the SDGs, there's no doubt. But most of our clients, most people on the streets have no idea what an SDG is. So we're bringing together the fashion industry, um, well-known names, and producing bracelets. Let's go to the next slide. One for each of the SDGs that people can buy it comes with two and they can share them and these bands are sustainably sourced um, and they're made by women in nepal whose um, whose factories have been audited by uh, an organization to ensure that the supply chain is clean and it's empowering women and you get two bands and the idea is share it with somebody share it with somebody who who may not know about the sdgs to raise awareness and the proceeds of this campaign go towards uh, some some towards ubs optimist foundation to fund our programs also towards bottle top which is the partner in this and also towards one of the celebrities um, we celebrities causes so we're partnering with a number of celebrities you'll see today we launched um, sdg3 with david beckham and part of the money, 20% of it will go towards the cause that they care about. So it's not only raising awareness, but it's also trying to raise funding. Uh, and that is, uh, in a nutshell, what UBS is doing in the philanthropy space and specifically around SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. That was fantastic. We, we actually um, asked for questions before the webinar. It helps us shape the presentations, but any of you who have questions you'd like to ask Phyllis or me, please, uh, you know, put them in the chat box and we'll 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 get to them. Uh, we received the most questions we've ever received pre pre webinar, so I want to I want to walk through some of those that may not may not have been um, touched on in our presentations. And one is is Phyllis this whole idea of prototyping. And, and how you can demonstrate success. How did you share those successes and how did that, you know, again, build a movement within UBS to support the broader SDGs? Um, how, how do you position and share with your colleagues the positive impacts that you've had and the work that you're doing to, again, work across UBS and society? How do you build that momentum within your institution? Well, what, what we did is um, we wanted to first build strong credibility within um, our, our community, so within the nonprofit world. And it took about, um, it took about a year. And what that involved was um, putting, it really, I had great support from leadership. And I said, let's, let's give it a try. Let's try to bring globally renowned experts onto the board to help us shape a revised strategy that's more in line with what our clients want, the needs in society. And so we did that. We brought in new board members. We completely revised our strategy. We brought in a firm to help us not to do it, but to teach the team how to think really strategically about how we can work and how we can develop portfolios that would be meaningful and substantive. We got advice from others in the field. And so we needed to build that credibility and it did take a while. It, you know, it took about a year to get through the strategy. Um, there was a lot of turnover in the staff too. There, you know, maybe we didn't have the right team to implement the new strategy. Um, some people didn't want the change. And um, so it involved a lot of change. There was quite a lot of tension, as you can imagine. And, and once we had that credibility and people looked at the strategy and the team and said, wow, you know, these guys know what they're talking about. This is, this is legit um, what they want to do. And it was a shift. And it wasn't to say that what was done before was bad because it was really great. It was just, we needed to take it <clears throat> to the next level. And in order to do that, we needed to have higher aspirations. And, um, and then we started 
to experiment and it was really nerve wracking. So the, for, for instance, um, when I first learned about social impact bonds and I remember sharing it with um, Maya Zisfeller and one, another colleague and we, we thought, this is so interesting. Why don't, why don't we try something like this in the development sector? And we were all so excited about it. And um, then I met Safina Hussein at Educate Girls and, and we did it and it took about a year to pull it all together. Um, I brought it to the board. I think partially the board um, thought, look, it's a small amount of money. Let's, let's, we'll test it. You know, I, I don't think, um, they weren't overly enthusiastic, but they thought it was interesting. And we weren't putting a lot of money at risk. We were using our funds, UBS funds, not client funds for this first one. And, um, and we watched it really closely. I mean, we were incredibly engaged in this to, to you know, we, we did want this to succeed because like I said before, even if this, you know, we never thought this was the silver bullet, but we wanted to start to experiment and um, create models and create expectations that that's what we were gonna do. Does that answer your question, Gal? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and I think that idea of, you know, staying for the long haul, it's not just a year investment and it's not just a three-year investment. The fact is you've taken this prototype and moved it to India-wide uh, initiatives or a larger scale so that you're, you're incrementally demonstrating positive impact, uh, lessons learned, and, there's, and, and getting a lot of positive media. Uh, external media and uh, and kudos within the organization. So building those incremental that incremental support system with successes, um, especially in in unknown territories like a dib um, or social success note, that it, you're educating your colleagues within an institution. And I think that addresses some of the questions that um, our colleagues have been submitting. How do you move this this? What's the process? that you use to not just with financial institutions, but build alliances within other types of organizations who are um, don't know what they don't know, are, are skeptical. And again, it's it's finding, experimenting, and, and testing and demonstrating results. I think it's really, really important. Um, Adini asks an interesting question, um, which is this blending of philanthropy and impact investing um, and how is UBS integrating those two um, in, in your work around SDGs? And, and asking me a question about, um, is, this, is UBS's experience a one-off? Um, and I think Aditi, the answer is no. There's a, there's a drive and a movement within the field of social finance um, because of client demands of, of CEOs who are, who are you know, reading the newspaper and, um, and picking up on how significant the issues are, whether it's the Amazon burning or whether it's a lack of equality of education um, throughout the world. Um, the World Economic Forum does a global risk analysis every year and interviews CEOs um, to really understand what keeps them up at night. And the fact is those issues that keep them up are issues of climate change, lack of access to water, lack of access to workforce that's educated, those are the intractable issues that we deal with in social finance. So there are parallels. The CEOs recognize it impacts their bottom line. So there is an awakening around these issues from a variety of factors, which I think is really moving the broader field of social finance and the financial institutions in different directions. Um, Phyllis, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um so Edelman, the PR firm, also does something every year that they launch at WEF called the Trust Barometer. Mm -hmm. And what that showed was that trust in NGOs is at about 52%. I think that was that was last year's. And um, you know, that that's pretty weak. Why is it that um people don't trust NGOs? Well, you know, it's probably because when we hear about them, we hear about scandals, unfortunately. And there is a big movement to try to promote more the great um, the great impact that's that's happening around the world, but we need to increase that trust. So we viewed this as a way to to do that, but we're not calling it impact investing. 
it is, you know, for us right now, it is still in our uh, philanthropic wheelhouse. Now, could, could that change? Could we deliver the returns to clients? Yeah, sure. We could. We're looking at ways that we might at one point be able to do something to, to return those gains so that clients can use it, recycle it in their donor advised fund, for instance, and use it again. Um, but we've been very careful not to mix the two because the message at UBS is re has really been very clear about financial returns related to impact investing. And we don't want to muddy the waters there. Um, and, and I think that would jeopardize the viability of this at this point. Now, mm -hmm. you know, could this change in the future? Yeah, sure, but we have to demonstrate that it works and we have to demonstrate it over a longer period of time than three years and with much more, um, with much greater scale than $270,000. Uh, the last, we've since launched an, uh, additional development impact bonds. We have one now that's at uh, $11 million with potential to grow even more. And we're creating one, working with a number of bilateral donors that hopefully would be uh, closer to 100 million. And uh, so I think there, we're working our way there, mm -hmm. but we need more time and more evidence. And in terms of, you know, one of the interesting thing, again, social finance course and, and anyone who's signed up for this will receive a copy of the case study, the program of study that we've done on the social finance portfolio, um, as well as access to your to videos. Um, I think that idea of one of the things that was interesting as we were doing the analysis is that your team represents very different perspectives, finance, international development, and how have you created a common taxonomy um, or language that allows your different team members with different perspectives and backgrounds to unite around a common um, strategy and bring their unique talents to the table? Um, so I, when I remember very uh, first board meeting after we developed our strategy, we went in uh, and our board comprises 50% UBS executives, it's chaired by UBS's CEO and has um, members of the group executive board and other very senior members of staff on the um, on our board and also external experts. And external experts uh, comprise primarily people from our sector, from the nonprofit sector um, who have worked, for instance, at Gates Foundation or our experts in monitoring and evaluation come from the countries in which most of our our philanthropy is given. So we use the language um, theory of change and we were confronted with blank stares. And uh, that was a really important lesson that we sit in a bank, we have to use the language of the bank. You know, the more we use a different language and, and speak differently, then, um, then we'll, the, the least likely it is that we're going to be an integral part of the business model of UBS. So that was a, a real eye opener for us. And even though our staff comprises people from the finance world, people from the nonprofit sector, government, um, bilaterals, we all are sitting in a bank and are using the language of the bank. And um, it it's it is it is a um, it's an exercise <laughs> because <laughs> constantly have to tell some staff, for instance, who who have worked only in the nonprofit sector, that we can't send a document out to anybody at UBS that uses language like theory of change, sustainability, um, you know, any of these buzzwords that we use in the nonprofit sector so freely or acronyms, um, you know community building, all of these things that we just take for granted in this sector, we can't use any of that language. We have to use the language of UBS. Well, and it's interesting in our programs, again, we call it lost in translation so that we, 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 we begin by talking about the term equity. Now, someone in social justice or social change will have one perspective and someone coming from bank 
um, or the financial sector will define equity differently. So uh, for colleagues who are on the, on the participating and listening in, um, it's an exercise that we have in class. It's a fascinating group conversation about the, the term equity. Um, Annabelle, I want to see if there are any other questions that you've gotten uh, via chat that you want to share with us. Yeah, I've had a, a lot of... Like a lot? Yeah, quite a few. <laughs> There's a lot of engaged people. Um, I, if I start maybe with, with one or two and then we'll see how we do for time. So um, I've got one uh, here from David, who actually I remember who attended social finance last year. Hi, David. Nice to have you on the call. Um, he has asked, uh, with so many SDGs and underlying problems to solve, how are priorities decided and who decides? So at, at UBS, we're really at with there's there's two things. We've got the foundation and then we have UBS writ large. At the foundation, we initially registered as a children's foundation focused on health and education and child protection. That's how we registered in Switzerland. And that is really the, the entity um, that kind of drives the strategic vision. And so that is set. We can't change that unless we dissolve the foundation, which we don't intend to do. Um, and these are also areas that our clients care about. And we know this because this is areas where most of them are, have been giving philanthropically. So those areas are set for us. However, we, we did, um, we see a gaping hole um, because we haven't been doing issues, focused on issues around climate change, for instance. Um, and so that is an area that we're adding. For the bank, the bank itself also focuses in the communities in which UBS is located. So for instance, we have community fairs here in the US and, the, and also in the UK. And the objectives of community affairs is quite different than Optimus Foundation. Community affairs is uh, corporate social responsibility. It's, it's really giving back to the communities in which we are working. And the focus there is around entrepreneurship and education. And again, those were selected because it's aligned with the business. It's an area that's that's in UBS's DNA, um, and so there. And and then environmental issues are are extremely relevant when it comes to our policies and procedures. And the Together Band campaign is really just about raising awareness of all of them. But it doesn't mean we as an institution are going to focus on all of them. Hope that answers your question. Super, thank you. Uh, we have um, another question here from Amalia, um, which is how do you mitigate the risks of investments when they're made in uncharted territory? <laughs> That's a great question. That is the question that keeps me up at night. Um, so if we think about what is the risk here, um, the real risk of these is um, delivery risk. Um, Generally speaking, we're partnering, and that means that the that the implementing organization won't be able to deliver, and it could be for a number of reasons, force majeure. It might be that they got the baseline wrong. The problem actually wasn't as bad as they thought, um, and and we see that all the time. You know, we think a problem's bigger than it is, and then when we conduct the baseline analysis, we see, oops, wait a minute. You know, this is, I mean, good news is it's not as bad as we thought. Um, however, that changes the whole cost model of the intervention. So how do you mitigate that? Well, one way is, um, is through doing the baseline. You have to really understand what is the problem and what are the potential risks. We have a whole risk model also. We have a risk circle and we sit and we meet regularly and, um, we look at what are all the 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 risks here. You know, there's third-party payment risk in a DIB, but typically we're partnering with um, organizations where that is not a huge risk. Um, and in terms of the implementation risk, it's really about uh, making sure that the organization has a robust performance management system in place. We've got a really good external evaluator who is keeping us apprised regularly, and um, you know, that we've got people on the ground who are there regularly. And, and I think it's also, Phyllis, really important and, and for our listeners to understand when you're dealing with these big issues, um, that honesty, that constant recognition that things will, could go wrong, 
likely will go wrong and how do you mitigate that risk? Um, and, and I think, again, making a commitment for not just a year, but actually recognizing up front that there's alignment, we're experimenting, there's risk associated with it, we're going to learn through this process, and we're going to share the things that we've learned. And that honesty is really important. That's part of a cultural, that's your DNA. Um, so it's not happy talk, it's saying we are recognizing the risk, we're addressing it, and we're learning iteratively as we go through this process. And understanding, as you saw from Educate Girls, that had there not been that honest feedback, um, the end results for the third year may not have been, wouldn't have been the same, right? So there's this constant learning. It's having a rigorous impact and evaluation methodology um, and, and an openness among your partners to talk about the challenges that you face, as well as accelerators for good. With that, I'm going to say I'm going to turn it over to Annabelle. I want to thank you, Phyllis, for joining us today, and Annabelle, for you to um, wrap this up by talking about how colleagues can join us in social finance, or impact yeah. investing, or impact measures. Yeah, th thanks very much, Gail, and thank you to everyone who's taken the time out of the day uh, to come to the webinar. I hope you found it valuable. Uh, we will be dropping an email next week with a recording of the webinar, um, um, as well as um, our case study um, attached to that email as well for you to have a look at. Um, our next programme taking place will be um, in November, which is social finance. Um, I've got a really exciting lineup of speakers um, for that coming. So obviously Phyllis being one of our fantastic speakers that will be joining us for the week, but also uh, Bruce Lowry from the Ivy Foundation, um, Ellen Dorsey from the Wallace Global Fund and, and Naina Batra from AVPM. Uh, just a, a handful that will be joining us throughout the week. Um, our programme following on from that will be next March, which is Impact Investing. Um, and then Impact Measurement will be taking place um, at, towards the end of um, next June. If you have any questions on the programs or want to find out more please just drop uh, myself or my colleague Rola an email our details can uh, be seen on screen and um, so you've got our email address there and our phone numbers um, we'll also be launching uh, from September a monthly impact newsletter so um, if you would like to be signed up to receive this please drop me a line directly and I can make sure that you're on the mailing list um, and that will have kind of lots of information about events coming up such as webinars programs um, as well as stories of what our alumni um, and our speakers are up to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but that, thank you very much again for everyone. Um, Gail, is there anything that you'd like to finish on today? No, just thank you. I'm looking forward to uh, November. And um, we do have some scholarships. I think that we're full for social finance, um, but for our programs, we do um, have scholarships available. So um, reach out to us. And Phyllis, thank you again. We will see you in November. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure, and I loved speaking at that program, and I'm still in touch with many of your students, one whom I heard from yesterday. <laughs> so uh, thank you for having me on this webinar. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing some of you again in November at Oxford. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.